Good evening, everyone. All right, good evening. Let's try it again. Good evening. Yes, thank you. Welcome, welcome to Cedar Lane Unitan Universalist Congregation in our gathering in our beautiful chapel this evening for a special conversation with uh, someone who is uh, amazing and uh, wonderful in her analysis, insights, and sense of humor. I'm Abhi Janamanchi. I'm uh, serving Cedar Lane as senior minister and uh, really honored to be able to have this conversation uh, with Karen Tumulti, who is uh, a renowned columnist with uh, the Washington Post and is known for her analysis and thought-provoking commentary on American politics and social issues. And with a career that spans decades in journalism, she has garnered recognition for her insightful perspectives and engaging writing style, which I know many of us are big fans of. And also, Karen is a Cedar Lane friend. Uh, her, her, her husband, Paul Richter, and uh, his family have been longtime members of Cedar Lane. And so we are delighted to claim you, Karen. <laughs> and uh, we have quite a few who are joining us online this evening. Uh, welcome to all those who are joining us on YouTube, uh, especially the group that's uh, joining us uh, at Ingleside. Uh, I hear that there's uh, uh, hundreds of people gathered that are, that are doing a watch party tonight. So welcome. We're delighted that you could uh, join us for this conversation. Um, so uh, I hear we have some technical difficulties with our streaming this evening. So uh, those of you who are watching us may feel like uh, Karen and I are on slow motion video uh, because of the, the LAN issues that we've been having. So but the sound should be fine. Uh, feel free to let us know on uh, the chat uh, about how it is. And uh, also, we will be doing some questions uh, afterwards. Uh, so if uh, you have some questions, uh, those of you who are here, if you would write them out on the cards. And uh, those in the chat uh, may include your questions in the chat. We'll try to address them as we go along. Welcome. Oh, thank you. It's, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. As you mentioned, uh, Cedar Lane is very near and dear to my family. Um, my husband came here as a child. Wow. He's not a child anymore. <laughs> wow. Uh, so, uh, uh, Karen, I. Uh, you know, you've been uh, uh, discussing the evolving landscape of American politics. Uh, and uh, I wanted to ask uh, what you believe are some of the key factors that are shaping the 2024 election cycle, uh, particularly in terms of what uh, you are hearing uh, from, from voters, you know, the, the sentiments of uh, voters and also uh, some of the party dynamics? Well, uh, certainly th I've been spending a lot of time out in the country um, covering the primaries, covering several Senate races. And when I talk to voters, I find that they are usually one of two things this year. They are either angry or exhausted by mm. all of this. Um, but I, at the beginning of the year, my editors wanted to do a series of columns um, going to those of us who specialize and say, you know, what's going to be the biggest question on your beat this year? And they wanted me to kick it off because it's an election year. And I thought about it for a while. And what struck me is how often when something really terrible happens, you hear politicians of both parties saying, this is not who we are. Um, 
you certainly heard it from Joe Biden in his announcement video, hearkening uh, back to the march in Charlottesville after the uh, January 6th riot. Kevin McCarthy said, what we're currently watching unfold is un-American. I'm disappointed. I'm sad. This is not what our country should look like. This is not who we are. Mm. Of course, a few weeks later, he was at Mar-a-Lago kissing the ring. So um, the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, this is a year that more than any election I can recall that really is going to define who we are, what our values are. Um, and so I've been trying to keep that in mind as well, um, because just, just the, the choices have just never seemed so stark. Yeah. And everything's on the line. It's not just the White House, it's the House, it's the Senate. Um, I think people really need to keep an eye on state houses across the country because now so much policy is being driven by uh, radicalized state legislatures. Yes. The, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, surprise expressed about the state of our democracy. Uh, you know, especially in a, in a way as if, uh, you know, it, it just can't happen here. You know, we, we are the, the mother of democracy, the citadel and, you know, the beacon for the rest of the world and, uh, and therefore, uh, you know, which, which at some level feels like, you know, being in denial uh, and, and also uh, a reluctance to recognize that, that the work of democracy is, is a work in process. Uh, and, and progress. Uh, you, you, your thoughts about that, Karen? Because you know you you've you, you made a point here just about you know how there seems to be that uh, that reaction. Uh, you know, I I think that one of the things that has been shocking is the you know the fact that Donald Trump has been so outspoken about how he intends to govern as an authoritarian. And it, it's surprising to me how many Americans seem like they would welcome that. And I, um, it's, I did a little bit of digging for a column I wrote in December and found a statistic in there that really shocked me. And it's about young people and mm. their faith in democracy and they're at, the, at Penn State, they, they do something called, um, it's called the Mood of the Nation poll. They've been doing it for decades. And one of the questions they ask people is, is democracy the best in all circumstances? Does it make no difference whether we have a democracy or a dictatorship? Or are there actually circumstances in which a dictatorship is preferable? And when you get down to talk, to look at young people, like Gen Z, 18 to 25 year olds, believe it or not, almost half of them will answer either it doesn't make a difference or there are actually some circumstances where dictatorship is preferable. And millennials, mm -hmm. it's almost a third. And you compare that to, for instance, the silent generation, which is now 77 years old and up, nobody believes there are circumstances under which a dictatorship is preferable. And again, it, it, the curve is really pronounced by age. And I, I was thinking, why have young people really lost their faith in democracy? And I think there are really two reasons. One is they didn't grow up as so many of us did, our parents, you know, under a, you know, in, engaged in the fight against Hitler, and those of us who grew up in the Cold War, where the, you know, we were all afraid of extinction because of the authoritarians in the Soviet Union, and these kids have have never lived under that kind of threat. 
But I also think just as important is that they have never lived at a time when government was actually functional, when a democracy could actually deliver the things that they care about, whether it's action on climate change or whether it is doing something about gun violence or even delivering an economy where they feel that they can buy a house someday. And so I think, you, I think one thing to really keep an eye on this year is what happens with young people. And I, you know, I think there's a really good chance that a lot of them are just gonna feel inclined to sort of check out, which is pretty depressing. It is, it is, and uh, uh, we're, we're hearing from young people about their, their being uh, very disillusioned and really not trusting uh, anything that, that is spoken and the lack of action on some of those things really seems to be driving that, that level of disconnect and uh, disillusionment with, with our politics. And, and uh, I feel that may well have an impact in, yeah. in the elections. Uh, you, uh, I, I was uh, really uh, struck by your insightful column about uh, uh, Senator Menendez and uh, what's happening in New Jersey. Uh, uh, it was quite insightful. Uh, could you elaborate on the broader landscape of uh, political corruption uh, in, in today's context? Well, this is actually a good news story about politics. What happened, I don't know how many of you followed what was happening in the New Jersey Senate race. New, Senator Menendez, I mean, the, the, the scandal there, you know, the feds raided his house and they found hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of gold bars and uh, Mercedes and, you know, it, they went in his closet and he had hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash stuffed in his clothes, but he's insisting there's nothing unusual about any of this. Um, but he is, uh, and again, he has not been convicted. He's insisting he is innocent, but of bribery, which is what he's accused of taking bribes. But the fact is there, there, was, there is a culture in New Jersey. It really is kind of the last state where the political machine is still alive, that the party bosses control everything right down to the sh whose name gets put where on the ballot. And so what was going to happen this year is that all, the fix was essentially in for the governor's wife. I mean, it felt a little almost soprano-ish there. All the county chairmen, were, most of whom do business with the state of New Jersey, were lining up to support the governor's wife. Who, and there was a, there's a congressman named Andy Kim. First, I believe he's the first Korean-American congressman from New Jersey. He comes from the Philadelphia suburbs. And he actually announced he was running, and he decided to challenge these party chairmen, and specifically their ability to put people's names where they want them on the ballot. If, you, if you're their favorite candidate, you're right there where you can see it. And if you're not, your name is somewhere in what they call ballot Siberia. And what he found as he was going from county convention to county convention was a lot of people who felt the way he did, that they had just felt they were sick of this. And all of a sudden, he was winning county delegates across the state, including in the governor's wife's own Monmouth County. And finally, she, in, on Sunday, decided to drop out of the race. And, you know, it... Like I said, you do, it was a good news story because it was somebody who was really challenging the system and really finding, and it took, as I wrote in my column, you know, Andy Kim, the congressman, threw a grenade into the party machinery in New Jersey, but it was really Bob Menendez who pulled the pin. Right. I mean, people, <laughs> people looked at this and they just went, okay, this is, we can't tolerate it anymore. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, Senator Lieberman's passing and uh, your, your reflection uh, about his, his uh, career and his legacy. Uh, it was, again, uh, another piece that uh, I, I really appreciated. Uh, he really never acknowledged his, uh, the, the mistake about the Iraq war. You know, it wasn't something that, uh, uh, at least I have not uh, seen or heard anything that, that he indicated. Uh, your, your thoughts about uh, his... Well, his, his commitment to his own moral compass was both his strength and his weakness. I mean, he was seen as a figure of great rectitude in the Senate. Um, he was willing to stand up and criticize Bill Clinton during, during the scandal that led to his impeachment when few Democrats were. In fact, that was how he ended up on Al Gore's ticket. Mm -hmm. um, as one of my colleagues at um, Time Magazine wrote at the time, uh, basically, Gore was looking for a life-size can of air freshener. And uh, that, was, that was what Joe Lieberman represented. And again, he had very fixed principles. He was very much of a centrist. But he was, again, somebody who was so sure of his own rectitude that it really did he put him on, you know, in, in positions that he, you know, he would never look back on. Right, right. Hmm. Uh, another uh, piece you wrote about uh, essential workers and uh, the, uh, you know, the, the broken immigration system and, of course, uh, Congress's continued paralysis uh, around, uh, you know, in any way creating any form of meaningful immigration reform, and uh, the irony of uh, calling people essential workers and really, you know, not, not caring a whit about them. You know, and I've got to tell you, I had never really thought about the connection between these two things until I was in Los Angeles in February covering the Senate race. I was at an event for an immigrant rights group where they were all endorsing Adam Schiff for the Senate. And this very impressive young man stands up, 20 years old, college student, and he's about to cast his first vote. But he, he says, you know, I grew up in the Central Valley of California. The Central Valley produces 25% of the entire food supply for this country. And he said, my parents are undocumented. And I grew up always knowing that they were invisible to this country. But he said it wasn't until COVID that I realized the, the real injustice, because my parents were, because they were declared essential workers, had to go out every day and risk their lives for a country that could deport them. So I decided to start digging around on all of this because this young man's, this young man so stuck in my mind. And um, I discovered that of all the job classifications of people who were declared either by state government or the Department of Homeland Security as essential workers, they, they couldn't do their jobs by Zoom. They had to show up every day and risk their lives. Five million of them were not permanent legal residents of this country. Of that five million, one million are dreamers, mm -hmm. those, those young people who were brought to this country by their parents. Um, and, you know, so we, we put these people in this situation of, we've got to, you've got to go to work. We need you to work, 
but you don't have any kind of legal status. So I wrote a column. It's online now. I think it'll be in the paper at some point over the weekend. But there is legislation that is being sponsored in both the House and the Senate, alas, it's not going anywhere, that would, in fact, create a path to legalization for anyone who is deemed an essential worker. I mean, that seems pretty fair to me. I mean, these are not, it isn't like they would, you know, with a snap of the finger, they would have to apply for a green card. They would have to pass a background check. If, you know, they want to become citizens, they would have to take a test that probably most of us couldn't pass. Um, but again, I just think that people, right now, the, the entire immigration debate is all about this awful chaos at the border, but nobody is really thinking of immigration, certainly nobody on Capitol Hill, including, by the way, now the Democrats, are looking anymore at really the larger picture of an immigration system that is, is broken in so many ways. It is. Thank you. Um, what, what is your sense about the, the polarization that we see? I mean, you know, extreme polarization and how that is influencing voters' minds and you know their behavior, uh, and also you know what, what what are some of the campaign strategies that you're seeing, either you know trying to capitalize on this polarization or figure out a way to bridge it. Yeah, I think at this point, um, and the polarization, there are a lot of different reasons for it. I mean, everybody will always point to gerrymandering. But that doesn't explain what's happening in the Senate. Mm -hmm. um, the fact is, you know, I think there are a number of reasons. I mean, people who live in cities now have just a very different view of the world than people who live in rural America. Um, it, people have different media diets. They don't listen to the same sources of information. Um, in a lot of ways, you know, their local media has died, so everybody's going to their kind of tribal, favorite tribal channels. But I, I used to think there was a fix for it somewhere, and I do think we could, there's some things we could do with our elections. I think ranked choice voting is a terrific idea. Um, instead of you know, voting for the Republican or the Democrat, you would kind of, if it was a multi-candidate race, you would rank your choices, and it would really encourage people to try and reach out, not just to their own partisans, but maybe somebody who might rank them second or rank them third. I mean, there are kind of fixes that you can do at the margins but I honestly don't see what's, you know, what's going to fix the larger problem. I used to think back in the 2012 election, Obama used to talk about in terms of breaking the fever. Mm -hmm. he, his argument was that if he could get reelected, that would kind of break the fever of what had become so dysfunctional about Washington. That didn't turn out to be the case because four years later, we've got Donald Trump. So um, I don't know what fixes it, but I think at this point, both of the parties are, they're not engaged in persuasion anymore. They are both engaged in kind of mobilizing their own bases. And I can't, I can't predict whether this is going to be a high turnout election, because one thing Donald Trump does is he drives turnout on both sides, or if it is going to be a low turnout election, because a lot of sane and sensible people are just going to say, it's not worth it. Right, right. Yeah, and we're also, you know, seeing in states like Michigan now with the, you know, the uncommitted, uh, especially around uh, the administration's uh, position on Gaza and, and what's happening in there. The, the Democrats have a number of problems in sort of 
holding together their traditional coalitions. Certainly, the, um, the situation in Gaza has a lot of people disillusioned with them. But again, as I mentioned earlier, young people mm -hmm. are not as engaged as they are hoping. And also, if you look at the the polling, it appears that you know the Republicans are also making inroads in with blacks and with Latinos, and especially with black men. Um, and so there are some polls, at least at this point, that suggest that Trump could get 19% of the black vote. That would just be extraordinary. Wow. Wow. And the Trump people tell me that's, they think they can get it up to 20, so, which right. would be just, just, you know, unprecedented, at least in modern times. Yeah. Uh, the Maryland Senate race. As if the Democrats didn't have enough to worry about. Uh, your, your, your insights. Uh, well, they, it really was. I, for the Democrats to hang on to the Senate as it is, they are going to have to run the table. They've got, you know, they're definitely going to lose West Virginia. Right now we have a, a 49-51 Senate. They're going to lose West Virginia. They're at 50-50. Um, they've got to hold on to every other seat that they have got. And Biden has to win so that his vice president is breaking the ties for them to hang on to the Senate. So they thought, you know, Maryland is one of the bluest states in the country. And so they thought this was not going to be one they had to worry about. And Larry Hogan has certainly um, changed that calculation. He, when he left office last year, his approval rating was over 70%. Uh, right now, he is leading in our poll and uh, every other poll I have looked at. Um, this is going to be a really interesting race to watch. It was another thing that was really interesting when I interviewed Hogan recently for my column. One of the things he told me and was that one of the most pers he didn't think he wanted to be in the Senate. Like you can understand why. Um, he said one of the most persuasive people that he talked to was George W. Bush. Now, mm -hmm. it, to me, it was fascinating just because, uh, you know, you never hear what Bush is up to these days. A lot of people say, why doesn't he stand up to Trump? But he does seem to be at least trying to recruit more moderate, reasonable Republicans, um, whether I don't know how this race is going to turn out in Maryland. I think that if it looks like this is the seat that determines which way the Senate goes, I think the Democrats are going to push that argument. Um, but if it looks like the Senate is lost anyway, it may be that voters here will decide they'd rather have a Larry Hogan in the, in the room. I, I mean, I just don't know how this is going to turn out either. The Democratic primary is pretty interesting, too. It is, yes. Any predictions? Uh... Well, right now, David Trone told me he is prepared to spend $50 million out of his own bank account to, to win this race. Angelo, uh, Larry Trone, uh, uh, what did I say? David Trone, I'm Larry Hogan, David Trone. Um, he's a billionaire, and he $50 million probably doesn't feel like it's probably, you know, he could probably find that under a social sofa cushion in his house. But um, on the, on the um, other side is Angela also Brooks, the county executive of Prince George's County, former prosecutor, um, I think pretty well regarded. And she has now got pretty much the entire Maryland political establishment behind her. The governor has endorsed her. Van Hollen has endorsed her. Just this week, Jamie Raskin endorsed her. But she is running behind, and she's running a, you know, I think a lot of people are wringing their hands. They just don't think she's running the kind of campaign she needs to run. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I, I do want to get to uh, people's questions, uh, but I did want to ask you for some additional insights about uh, the Republican response to the State of the Union. Oh my gosh, Katie Britt. She was, she was about not even five minutes into this when I tweeted on my Twitter account that they were just, Saturday Night Live was just gonna have to bring back Kristen Wiig for this. Um, it was the most bizarre thing I think I had seen in a long time. Um, and it, you know, the, it's always dangerous to be the, the person who's given the dubious honor of being the person who responds to the president's State of the Union address. But I don't think we had ever seen a disaster quite like this. It was made for Saturday Night Live. And sure enough. And they did. Yes. If you all haven't watched it, it's... Uh... I mean, she's, here is a woman who is, you know, she's an accomplished lawyer. She spent much of her adult life in the Senate. She was the chief of staff for a senator. She was the deputy campaign manager. She ran the Alabama version of the Chamber of Commerce. And yet they put her in her kitchen. And as Tommy Tuberville, her fellow Alabama senator, said, you know, we, we wanted her to represent a typical housewife. And um, it was just sort of an overwrought uh, performance. Caricature. Right. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to uh, uh, turn to some of uh, the questions that uh, folks have uh, written. Uh, I also uh, so one question from uh, 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 online is: uh, How do you get political figures to talk to you? <laughs> oh, they don't all talk to me. Um, Sometimes you have to be really, really persistent. And then sometimes you just have to figure, okay, I made my, I, I made an effort and I'm just gonna go by what I can observe. Sometimes you end up talking to people who are close to them. Um, but usually, the, the other thing I have found is that most politicians, they don't, they, most of them are adult enough that they, they aren't going to expect you to agree with them all the time, but if they feel like you listen to them, if you considered what they had to say, even if you didn't ultimately find it persuasive, they'll usually talk to you again. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people say that uh, the... the uh, Biden campaign has a messaging problem and that the administration really is, is not doing a good job of getting in front of people with, with all the things that they have accomplished. And uh, so the question is, uh, what should they be doing to get out the information about all the great things that they've accomplished? Well, here's their problem. Um, it's people call this um, the, the vibe economy. The fact is, if, if you're going to the grocery store and eggs are $9, you're not going to feel very comforted by the fact that inflation is slower than it was last year. So telling people that they feel better than they think they feel is, is not going to work. Um, I think that two things. I think that... Biden's main concern a lot of people have about him is his age. He's mm -hmm. going to have to, there's all, the only way you can deal with that is get out there and demonstrate that you're on top of the job. And second, I think they need to be talking less about what I did for you last year and more about the future, more about what the world looks like if Biden is elected versus what the world looks like if Trump is elected. 
Uh, there is one other question I want to get to, but I, let me go through these. Uh, young people, young adults typically in grade school and high school no longer are taught civics, which includes study of democracy. Is this loss of curriculum a significant factor in the attitudes and disinterest in democracy and civic duty? You know, I think it is. And I also think that um, just the wars that we are seeing at school boards over curriculum. I mean, whether you can teach that you know, the, the history of slavery or, you know, the degree, and I think it's not just civics that doesn't get taught. It's increasingly our own history. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, you know, I think that's part of it. But I really think that young people, like everybody, they, they look at what goes on in their lives. They look at what kind of hope, what kind of optimism they have for the future. And I think that is, probably the main determinant. Right. Is there a future in which the Republican Party returns to its historic role in a functioning U.S. democracy? Oh, boy. I, I thought there was, I, but I, I just think that, you know, the, even the Reaganism version of being a conservative is just gone. Mm -hmm. And um, I do not know how the party gets it back. What, I mean, just look at all the people who are leaving Congress. I mean, one of the arguments that Larry H Hogan made with me is like, all the people who think like I do are going out the door. You know, Mitt Romney um, being a good case in point. Um, increasingly, all that you have left in positions of power are the loudest and most extreme voices in the party. Now, some people, uh, people will say, oh, Reagan started this, Newt Gingrich changed the tone in Washington. My own belief is that things really changed in 2010 with the arrival of the Tea Party. Because, the, and now I think it's, it's something like 70% of the House Republicans have arrived there since 2010. And what was different about the Tea Party congressmen and women coming in was that they were elected explicitly promising not to pursue an agenda, but to stop things from happening. And they have really lived up to that promise. Um, you know, it was, I mean, other generations of Republicans came promising a, a conservative agenda. The Tea Party types, the people who have generally been elected in the last 14 or 15 years, they believe that, you know, they are here to, to gum up the works. And certainly we see this happening in the fact that, you know, the, the, what goes on with, the, the, with, you know, the speakership of the House. I mean, and that they are down to a one, they can lose one vote and that's it. And they are just holding Mike Johnson. And not, I say they, I'm talking about 10 or 12 of them are holding him hostage. Mm -hmm. Uh, will the, the MAGA movement uh, trying to outlive. outlive Trump? And if so, who will lead it? I, the thing is, it's like, it's like that movie Alien where the mother alien gives birth to all the baby aliens. I mean, it's, there are now so many people in Congress, in state houses, who are, have totally bought into the MAGA agenda. So I think it, you will not see a figure again, I think, as dominant as Donald Trump is, but this philosophy, I think, is gonna be with us for a while. So Sigourney Weaver won't be able to right, say this. No. Oh. Sigourney Weaver for president, so. Oh, well, McCarthy got thrown out, and for the, 
you know, for the apostasy of keeping the government open, you know. Um, and he was, one thing though that is gonna be interesting to watch, because the Democrats in the House were not willing to lift a finger to save Kevin McCarthy. And quite frankly, I couldn't see that they had any reason to. Uh, they despised him, that he, you know, would blame them for everything even though they weren't even in the majority. But I do think there's a possibility that a number, if, if, it, if Marjorie Taylor Greene follows through on her threat to, uh, you know, call a motion to vacate the chair and put his job on the line, especially if he is willing to stand up for, say, aid to Ukraine and some of the other things that the Democrats would like to see, I do think you may see at least a handful of Democrats who will vote with him to save his job. Mm. In what circumstances do journalists have to reveal their sources? Oh my goodness. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because it used to be, for most of my career, we always assumed that our, our bosses would go to the wall for us. Um, and when I was at Time Magazine, uh, one of my colleagues was threatened with jail. It was a long time ago, scandal involving Scooter Libby. And wow. <laughs> Time Magazine um, turned over everything. Mm. Turned over his, his Google searches, turned over his emails. It, it was a corporate decision. They didn't want to spend the money to fight this in court, and we were all brought in for, um, you know, sessions in which we were told, "Don't save your notes," uh, and it was uh, a shock to a lot of us. And interestingly, too, like the Obama administration was very aggressive in going after reporters and and you know, Trump as well. I think the government's gotten more aggressive and um, you know, our, our cor corporate overlords are, are less so. Right. Uh, how can young people check out with abortion and birth control issues that affect them and why are so many black men turning towards the Republican Party? Well, if I can, yeah, and I, that is a very good question, two very good questions. Um, the first one is, I think that with young people, if you make the, the kind of, um, you know, broad arguments about democracy and preserving democracy, it's really not going to be the kind of thing that motivates them. But if you can bring it down to, here is a right that you had and that you don't have now, um, I think you, you can see young people mobilizing. You certainly saw it last year in Ohio when um, you know, they, they voted to keep abortion legal. And it was, you really did see young people coming out because it was a very specific it was a very specific thing that they had on the line. Um, as for black men, um, there's a lot, I think, um, that it's, a lot of it is economic. It, a lot of people who are African American and Hispanics are on working those frontline jobs. They were the ones who got hurt by the COVID shutdowns. Um, and I do think that the Democratic Party is doing a much better job speaking to black women than they are to black men. Yes. How did you get into journalism and did you always want to be a political commentator? Oh, goodness. Um, well, I started working on my college newspaper and just absolutely loved it. And I really thought I wanted a job that, I mean, here I am in my late 60s and I still get excited to go to work every day. 
Um, and it, I did not, though, know that I'd be covering politics. In fact, Paul, when Paul and I met, we were both financial reporters at the Los Angeles Times. I had actually gone back to business school. I'd gotten an MBA. Um, but when the LA Times offered me a chance to come to Washington, and I, my first job was covering Congress and the California delegation, and it just, uh, it, it just really is a, you know, chance to travel the country and see how people live and examine what they care about. And, you know, I've been doing it ever since. Thank you. Wow. Um, so you, you wrote a column about a what if column. What if Biden or Trump drop out or... Or die, or, die. <laughs> or get incapacitated. Yeah, it was a very morbid column. <laughs> it was literally about morbidity. Um, but it did seem to me that people were starting to wonder about this. I mean, we have the two oldest presidential candidates that we've ever had. And people look at them and worry. So I did, I did say, well, you know, what if one of these guys, you know, gets the nomination, and then for whatever reason, it could also include going to jail, um, it can't can't do it. And I was really interested in discovering that there are actually procedures mm -hmm. that at this, you know, once a candidate gets the the delegates he needs for the nomination, and then say for some reason between now and the convention, something happens, we go to an open convention, and all of a sudden it'll be the you know political activists, the delegates, and it'll be a complete free for all. But then I said, well, what happens if something happens after the convention but before the election. And it turns out that what happens then is that the two political parties, their, their committees, would just have to pick someone new. And we saw something like this happen with McGovern and Tom Eagleton already was their nominee for vice president when he decided to drop out after um, the, the country, you know, after the, suddenly people were freaking out over the idea that somebody might have had mental health issues. Um, and so the, the, the Democratic National Committee, which is, you know, a bunch of top-level political insiders, picked Sergeant Shriver. But then what happens if we have an election but the Electoral College hasn't met yet. That happens in December, and something happens. And that is the freakiest scenario of all, because all of a sudden, you have the electors picked, but they would all suddenly become free agents. And we saw what happened in 2020 when it was a far less extreme situation than that. You know, the state legislatures all started mucking around. And that, to me, would be the you know, scariest period in all of this. Mm. And if, if, by the way, once you have the Electoral College has met and signed all their paperwork and sent it to Congress, at that point, it does automatically go to the vice president. Right. Uh, there's also this thing uh, that, you know, I've, I've been seeing, uh, especially in some of the right-wing media speculation that, uh, uh, you know, Joe Biden's going to show up at the convention and uh, step down and Michelle Obama is going to be That nominated. is the stupidest. Have you all heard that? And if there is anybody who, uh, Michelle Obama is out there living her best life. You right. Know, she's, <laughs> she's hanging out with Beyonce, you know, so... It's, th that is like the dumbest conspiracy theory I have heard. I mean, Michelle Obama wasn't even so thrilled about her husband running for president. So the idea that she has some secret desire to be 
president is just absurd. Right, and, and there's also, you know, uh, the other part of it is that Gavin Newsom is going to be her running mate or, or Jamie Raskin, I, uh, according to an Uber driver who told me so. <laughs> it must be true. <laughs> My, my Uber driver the other day wanted to talk to me about all the contrails up in the sky, so. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Although I must say, Gavin Newsom is, is running the best sort of shadow campaign for president that I think I have ever seen. It's like, well, if something happened, I'm here. Um, his, his takedown of Ron DeSantis was brilliant. No. I just, uh, I thought that was masterfully done. Um, what, is, what is your your sense of where we are as, as a nation, as a society, in, in what seems to be, you know, driving our, our uh, passion and engagement in, in really trying to shape our society. Uh, you know, I, I wonder about that, you know, uh, who, who are we now? Whose are we as we uh, you know, go through all this. Uh, the the election is is important, but to me, there's something deeper here, and and that points to the the body politic and and us, the people, and what 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 are you seeing, uh, especially you know in your conversations with people, and actually you know being with people who are living their lives and, and, and trying to be focused and engaged? Um. Well, I think that um, there's a columnist at the New York Times named Frank Bruni. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you're familiar with his work. He has a book coming out this month. I've got the galley and I'm about halfway through it. The title of the book is The Age of Grievance. Mm. And um, that is one thing I, and again, in political circles, as I travel, you know, I've been to a lot of Trump rallies, um, that you do find just, again, this, people feeling as though they've lost something and looking for somebody to blame for it. So often they cannot articulate what it is they think they've lost. But I do think that that, and, and you, see, you see a version of this as well on the left. Um, and, you know, people just not feeling like the future is, we have always been a country where people feel like the future is gonna be better, mm -hmm. and the future for your children is gonna be even better. But it, I, Frank at one point quotes the number of years that the polling where you ask people of the country on the right track or the, the wrong track. And it is now, it's been stuck for a, over a decade on the wrong track. And, and, and the weird thing is like the actual indicators of, I mean, we're at almost full employment at this point. Um, it's, you know, Inflation is eaten into it, and you can argue whether real wages are going up. But considering where we were just a couple of years ago in the middle of COVID, um, you know, things are better. But there, there is this sense of, of loss out mm. there in the country. How do we try to be more present to that sense of loss? Uh, I, you know, it's, it's sort of somehow summoning, I, I just, you know, again, I, I covered the Obama campaign in 08, and uh, it, hope and change feels like it was centuries ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you see, I, 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 I wonder about that. You know, there, there's all around us, there seems to be so much grief uh, that, that people carry in their lives. You know, uh, grief for what we have lost, a way of, of life, even, you know, if that was never the case, and, and a level of uh, nostalgia about something that really should not be the nostalgia uh, around. All, all of that underlying it, there is grief. And we seem to be lacking the capacity to be able to be present to that grief. Uh, to actually try to see each other, you know, across and through our differences, and and seem somehow caught up in, you know, getting entrenched in in our own positions, our own opinions, our beliefs, and uh, and and that seems to really affect the fabric. And, and causing, you know, the divide to deepen and the polarization more and more. And, and I struggle with, is, is there a way? And, and uh, are there things that we can look to from our history in previous, you know, political situations in, in being able to move through and, and maybe even, you know, create some common ground in a way that we can actually be well, we've certainly lived through worse. I mean, we survived a civil war. Um, and if you look at the decades after the civil war, it, do you see a lot of the, the same kinds of strains and the same kinds of polarization? Um, but I, I just think ultimately people have to start talking to each other again. Um, but you know, you talk about grievance. Donald Trump um, was on to, you know, he, he sensed what was out there. And I, I interviewed him a week before he was inaugurated in, in 2017, because I had always been fascinated by the fact that Donald Trump, six days after the 2012 election, mind you, Mitt Romney has just lost, the Republican Party is, is going through uh, you know, soul searching. We need to start being nicer. We need to appeal to women better. We need to. Donald Trump, six days after that election, filed with the Patent and Trademark Commission a trademark for the phrase, Make America Great Again. And if you you can find it online even now. It's like the block letters exactly like they are on the hats. And he sent in his $325 check and he got his trademark. And so I asked him, I said, what were you seeing then that other people weren't seeing? And he, and he, he went through all of the other slogans. He said, first of all, he says, the day after the 2012 election was when he decided he was running. And he said, no, of course I was going to need a slogan. And he took me through all of the slogans he was thinking about, including make America great. But he thought that sounded like too much of an indictment on the country, so make America great again. But he really sensed that people wanted to look backwards. And, um, and I think he sensed that people had a real idealized view of what things had been in the past. But I don't know if you remember how people would mock Make America Great Again in the 2016 election. Um, he, it was just a real sense that there was this vein of discontent in the country that he could, that he could tap. Mm -hmm. What was it like to be with his? <laughs> well, I, I haven't interviewed him that many times, but I it, it have it talked to him several times. I mean, he, uh, he it's pretty intense. And um, he will also go off on kind of tangents a lot. 
But he is very eager to win you over. Mm. Unless, you know, he's mad at something specific, you know. But it's a very intense experience. And you just kind of, you just kind of have to say, I'm, I'm just going to let this interview go wherever it's going to go because there's just no way to, you know, try and... Right. And sometimes just letting him go is you get the most interesting stuff out of him. And again, I'm not... haven't talked to him that many times, but yes. Right. This may be a naive question, but does Donald Trump have a sense of himself? Does Donald Trump have a sense of himself? He has an obsession with himself. <laughs> um, He's, uh, you know, I, I think the word you most often hear applied to him is narcissism. Mm -hmm. um, and he does measure everything by, he, he, he measures people by how loyal they are to him. He measures everything by, you know, how it, how it affects him. But does he do, does he have, doubts about things he does. I've never seen any evidence of that. Mm. Yes, sir. Cool. Um, do you want oh. this being the rise of Christian nationalism? You know, the, Christian nationalism, um, it, for one thing, you hear so many different definitions of what that is. Um, but I, th and you also, if you I've heard historians um, talk about it, and it's actually something that has been sort of embedded in the American character as long as we have been a country. But I think that what is coming to the fore these days in, Christ in what is defined as Christian nationalism is it's, it's racial. Mm -hmm. um, and it's ethno-nationalism. Yes, yes. It's a, and it's a phenomenon that's, you know, uh, we see that happening around the world. You know, uh, uh, the, the, the form of ethno-nationalism in India, for example, the Hindu nationalism, you know, that has now really become an integral part of the political machine of the BJP, the Bharatiya Janata Party, uh, and, and, you know, really has been branded into it, you know, and, and uh, you know, uh, Erdogan. And there's also a, often you hear a religious strain in authoritarianism as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, you know, they, while, while the, the individual stripes may be different, you know, they're, they're all cut from the same fabric. Yeah. And, and the, the intent is uh, e essentially to uh, propagate a worldview that that uh, uh, really is grounded in 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 subjugating and marginalizing, uh, so that so that there is there is uh, really a, an emphasis on on a monocultural way of living and way of being than a multicultural way of being, uh, and and to me that's. Uh, that's really what, what we're also seeing, uh, and, and populism goes well with it, and those two become uh, uh, really good partners in, in making that, that people actually feel that this is the way one has to be uh, in order to be able to have the kind of life that, that we seek. But, but it, it's also, and the argument is that, you know, some people are anointed by God. I mean, now you can buy a Trump Bible. So, um... For $50? <laughs> it's a Good Friday deal. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> right, just yep. in time for Easter. <laughs> well, I, and maybe a, a flip side of that is the extent to which, uh, you know, there are more people in the country who are identifying as not religious at all, and are they substituting politics for identity and uh, for religion? I mean, I don't know if in your reporting you've seen that. You sir, Yes, absolutely. And um, it's certainly with the, the degree to which the evangelicals have all 
you know, completely aligned with Trump, the white evangelicals. Um, yeah, it's, and those are, it is true. I mean, especially among young people, the, the greatest growth has been in the so-called nuns. Um, but it's, it, and a lot of the people who call themselves evangelicals and align with Trump don't even go to church all that often. So. Paris? We see arguments that American democracy is, democracy is in decline. Do you think it is in decline? Um, in terms of, you know, dem democracy being able to produce results, um, yes, absolutely. And, and, you know, it was sort of embedded that the democratic processes were going to bring people to consensus. And I think the machinery of democracy is really under threat. I mean, I think something we should all be worried about is how well, how well the machinery works this, this election, whether it's, you know, when you hear that, that secretaries of state are, you know, ordering tourniquet kits to be in polling places who, who are, it's, it's, it's frightening. Um, so I think we should all be concerned about how well this election is going to work. John? Well, well, I have kind of a follow-up question to that. Um, not that long ago, there was a, a cartoon in the Post um, right after there was a lot of discussion, early discussion about, um, oh yeah, Trump being kind of a active-minded old man. Uh, um, and there was a cartoon that said, you know, old man with poor memory, uh, Biden and Trump, Um, I think that that choice has not really been clarified. Um, and again, I think you can argue for democracy as sort of an ideal, but you have to bring it really home to people. You know, these are your rights that you have now that you may not have. Um, this is the economic policy, you know, it's bring back Trump and, you know, income inequality is one of the drivers has been tax cuts. I mean, I just think that people are going to have to have it sort of brought down to the nuts and bolts. I don't think that democracy is going to be sort of, that if people keep saying democracy is on the ballot, I think that is just too much of a, a concept and not a specific set of results. I wonder about how much the global economy and the global media that we now have and this is going away is complicating democracy in that we have always in our most of us growing up, America was the major superpower could dictate for a better world. And now there is so much feeding on us from the global economy, the difficulties in other parts of the world that we hear daily, that how much of that can our leaders really control? And in addition, is it feeding us so much that we're, that's one reason why the younger generation feels overwhelmed? And therefore, what is positive in democracy? So uh, for folks uh, watching, the question is about how much the global media and the global economy impacting all this. 
Well, I think that there is, and again, watch these next few weeks, aid to Ukraine. Um, there is now, there for a long time had been an isolationist, protectionist strain in the Democratic Party. But now it's really strong in the Republican Party. And yes, I can't tell you how many people I would run into in Iowa who would say, you know, why are we sending money to Ukraine when, you know, I don't get my disability payments or whatever. I mean, or, you know, the Republicans making the argument how, you know, we can't send money to Ukraine until we can control our borders, which, um, but yeah, I think there is a, a sense of, you know, the, the great internationalism uh, and the, you know, shining Ronald Reagan's going back beyond Ronald Reagan, but he used to love the phrase shining city on a hill. And that's just not how people, a lot of people in this country view it anymore. There's, there's a kind of shut the door and turn in among ourselves. Thank you. Well, <laughs> now, wait a minute. I'm leaving you on that. Well, I, I, I do apologize for leaving you on a very downbeat. Uh, oh, you know, one thing you need to know about Unitarian Universalists, you know, we're hopeful pessimists. So okay. I think, I think uh, we're, 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 you're, you're in good company here. Uh, so. Anyway, well, this thank has you. been wonderfully. Uh, thank you, thank you, you so, so much. much. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I didn't. I didn't track that. Uh, there were quite a few initially. Pardon? And then uh, a, a good group at uh, Ingleside. I was there today, and I saw the 